Hey everyone, uh, today we're going to be beginning our 10th lecture in our discussion about religion in the United States. And today we're going to be focusing on religion and American society uh, during the post-Civil War era. So really during the period that I have here entitled uh, Massive Amounts of Urbanization going uh, Occurring Throughout the United States, both um, primarily in the eastern uh, eastern coast coastal cities like New York, Boston, Baltimore, uh, but then also out in the West as well, the civil civil uh, civilizing the American West and the growth of that uh, and how religion responds to urbanization, as well as we're going to uh, towards the end talk about um, America's religious responses to massive immigrations once again um, after the Civil War, but primarily in the context of talking about American Catholicism and some additional struggles that American Catholicism has after the post-Civil War period. So first, before we can kind of begin, we need to talk about um, kind of setting up the stage for our discussions with uh, this topic at hand. And so really it's, we need to talk about kind of a very brief survey of what is known as the Gilded Age in a typical US uh, history course where you will talk about the Gilded Age being from 1870s all the way up until the uh, 1900s maybe. For me, I would even put it all the way up until the 1910s, this idea of the Gilded Age. So after the Civil War, America had really three stunning developments that had radically changed American life and had would come to dominate American uh, history, history and culture and ideology all the way up to really uh, the, the World War II, post-World War II era and afterwards. And the reasons for this is really three significant things. One being uh, the Great Migration that starts occurring after the Civil War and really prior to the Civil War, but gets interrupted, uh, but then resumes during um, after the Civil War and the Great Migration out west and the uh, civil civilizing and colonization of the American uh, West by um, American Europeans and then the conflict that will later come because of that and we'll we'll get to that here in a few moments uh, but number two also the massive growth in urban cities back east and 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 out west as well you know particularly San Francisco and Seattle only LA is really much uh, later to the forefront uh, by the 1920s really that LA becomes uh, a massive port for migration, but really San Francisco and Seattle for a very long period of time out west. But back east, uh, you know, New York City, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, um, these cities become hotbeds for massive amount of urbanization and growth. And we'll talk about how religion responds to that as well. And then third, what kind of tied all of this and made everything really possible uh, during this period known as the Gilded Age was the massive expansion of business and industry uh, in the in America. Primarily, a lot of it was due to uh, the nature of the Civil War and how uh, industrialization spurred uh, was spurred on because of the American Civil War, where factories, ammunition places, um, the government, the the Republican government, kind of teaming up with big business and kind of setting the stage to allow businesses to grow and expand at the cost of the mil of the, the U.S. government um, in order to win the Civil War. But then that relationship continues and comes to dominate the Republican Party for uh, really even up until today, um, its relationship with uh, what you'd say, quote unquote, big business. But it happens here. And because of that, America experiences this, you know, uh, historic, unprecedented level of growth and thus becomes known as the Gilded Age. So for the American West, um, the reason why the American West was so popular for people moving uh, uh, out West and the Great Migration, why is it so fantasized in many of our Spaghetti Westerns or Clint Eastwood, John Wayne movies? Um, it's because of what the American historian Frederick Jackson Turner had described 
And what he had argued is that the American West, what it represents is it represents the defining process of what is now what is American culture and what is American civilization. And he's absolutely right. You know, the idea of taming the West builds into the characterization of what is seen as an American. Um, you know, the ca image of the cowboy or, um, you know, f the image of the, uh, you know, the the hero that can come and save the day at any moment. This is this idea that get codified with the civilization and the settlement of the American West. Um, why, you know, Second Amendment rights and Second Amendment advocates are so prominent is because really a lot of it has its roots with the American, you know, West, where the law was uh, very much individualized was you know very inadequate at these times so you thus you know you needed a good guy with a gun um and so that kind of character resistance gets started and gets painted with our uh, settling of the american west and so the pr frontier um promoted this kind of formation of a composite american nationality that we really get um sentimented later on again the i you know the the american cowboy the optimist the individualist the the self-reliance the man that doesn't need a city that lives by his own wits his own morals his own principles even at the expense of corrupt cor you know corrupt um bureaucrats corrupt government officials or police like in so many of the john wayne slash clint eastwood style movies that they all kind of become codified in what we know as american exceptionalism but with a different more individualistic bent so again the american cowboy the american settler the you know the homesteader that all he's doing is trying to create a better home for his family you know uh protecting his family his young wife his daughter his children um against you know savages against criminals with you know with a handgun or you know with a rifle and then all the American guy wants is just to, you know, be able to raise his crops, raise his family and have a piece of land, the American dream. And it really gets, again, codified with American settling of the West. And so between 1860 and so, you know, the start of the Civil War until the turn of the 20th century, the population out West grew dramatically because many of course again because so many people were fleeing the uh the east the, the war-torn south or the war-torn uh, uh american east and trying to go out and make new beginnings for themselves and their families uh out west but more but probably 80 to well i'd say about 50 50 percent to close to 80 percent of the people who did go out west were actually immigrants, um, either first or sometimes second generation immigrants who had come to America and were initially not welcomed. Uh, and so thus they moved further and further out west where, you know, the sentiments and the populations are less and less um, in order to make a living for themselves. And so you can see again why America experienced this traumatic boom was because of this great migration towards the American West. For the other two developments, mass growth of cities, urbanization, and businesses, uh, what it did, why they are so important, is because it transformed America from what had been the dominant form of American identity, politics, industrialization, uh, of what Thomas Jefferson had and his idea of an agrarian republic. And so what I mean by an agrarian republic is a, you know, a public that was less um, centrally controlled, um, less er industrialized because Jefferson saw some of the problems that industrialization would have in here in America that it would typically call, you know create a cutthroat type society that would later you know kind of be, become a, a de defining characteristic of capitalism. Uh, but you know it was the idea of the individual in, individual and thus America is to 
um, be a government, be a, a country, a politics that was dedicated to the rights and the, and the protections of the individual and even protecting the individual from government and from progress at some points. And this had become the dominant view of thinking until really uh, with James Buchanan's presidency and then subsequently Abraham Lincoln's presidency and beyond, America changes into what Alexander Hamilton had originally designed and wanted for the America, for the United States as being a his vision of an industrialized, centralized control, central you know a great uh, a great centralized power source of power that can not only unite societies but help um, push other societies towards progression, and so he he dreamed of a more industrialized nation that would be able to compete with other cultures, other societies in Europe, but also eventually Alexander Hamilton foresaw that America could pass, surpass England and France and all of the old European countries because of the vast territories here in America and because of the vast resources here. And he was ultimately right and that now the Republican Party had switched and had become more of an industrialized um, party. Thus, the America, uh, United States is becoming much more of an industrialized uh, period. And that's what we get called the Gilded Age. So again, like I say, from 1870 up until the 1900s, but I would actually include it another 10 more years to the 1910s. Uh, but typically, most people cut it off at the turn of the century. And so the Gilded Age, why is it another reason why is it so important? Not only because of these massive ways of development, but also because the promises that were there after the Civil War. That the Civil War was over, and then now we had a new promise age of prosperity, but also uh, a new in the context of religion of how we talked about the civil war being seen as this kind of millennial um, battle between the forces of good and evil and thus God and the forces of the union prospering thus uh, ushers in a new religious age, a new millennium in which peace and prosperity would reign over everyone. And so by the time we get to the 1870s, 1876 and beyond, we start seeing that. We start seeing the, the new kind of promised age of prosperity here in America. And so this is another reason why it's called the Gilded Age is because of after the Civil War, there was all these hopes and expectations, and they were, to an extent, partially fulfilled. Now, we'll talk about in the field of religion here how some had saw that it was not being fulfilled, and we'll get to that here in a moment. And so between uh, 1860 to 1900, the population of America's cities, particularly the eastern sections of America's cities, tripled and in some cases like Chicago, quadruple in size. And so, for example, New York City had a population of the five boroughs, less than a million people by the time of the Civil War to by the turn of the new century, we're getting close to four million people. Uh, within the Isle of Manhattan, uh, and so this and so this period was fueled. The American population, cities, you know, tripling, quadrupling, was fueled primarily by immigration. Thirty-eight million um, people from uh, Central European countries and Southern European countries, like Italy or Germany, or the Czechoslovakias and areas like those. We're massively coming to America, 38 million people. Um, that's, you know, uh, bigger than the state of California coming during this time. And so America experienced a massive amount of growth and prosperity because of urbanization and because of immigration. And so be, now we have massive amount of peoples coming to the cities. We need jobs. We need to uh, uh, modernize our American cities. And so thus urbanization typically always equals industrialization and vice versa. And so now because of that, um, personal wages during this time had increased by 60%. So people were able to make money. So that's again why it's called the Gilded Age is this 
prosperity, this promised age of prosperity seemed to be at everybody's reaches. And so that's why 38 million Europeans are wanting to come to America because America represents a land of opportunity. However, the term gilding uh, is a representation also, kind of a tongue-in-cheek um, little nod to some of the other problems that were going on during this period. So even though this was this promised age of prosperity and this golden kind of golden age, the problem with gilding is that gilding is basically a thin layer of gold, very thin sheet layer of gold, sometimes as thin as a piece of aluminum. So imagine you take a block of wood and you just put some aluminum foil on it. That is really what gilding does. The object is not completely solid gold, but it has a thin layer of gold around it. But within the heart of that object is something that is quite unimpressive, quite decaying. And so thus the term gilded age, excuse me, uh, gilded age refers to this period of thin layers of true economic prosperity and a true air tr thin very true thin layer of promise prosperity and fulfillment actually coming true and so the term gilded age actually comes from one of the Ameri the great american writers and one of my favorite american writers being mark twain and one of his lesser known novels but importantly um, significant novel of the, what is called, quote, the Gilded Age, the tale of today. And so he's writing it in 1873, and he's writing it in direct response to the Civil War and all the promises that would have naturally have come after the Civil War. Again, this idea that um, now with the forces of the federal government winning over the rebel Confederates and over the wrong uh, ideology that the Confederacy had, and that the new promises that would come with it, with you know the 14th, the 13th, the 14th, and 15th Amendment, that we would have a new age of American prosperity. And Mark Twain's you know novel is largely shows that this is just a huge satirization of the promises of this golden age that was followed. That you know African Americans were supposed to be set free, and that they were supposed to be given you know. Uh, uh, stipends from the government of 40 lands of acre acreage out of the of many of the rich prosperity that many of the southern rebels had owned you know whether it's plantation lands or rich farm lands um, that these lands were going to be divided up and given to many of the slaves who had worked the land the promise of protection for the African American community in the South, as the South goes undergoes reconstruction, fell flat on its face. That even though for a while it remained true that martial law had taken effect in many of the Southern territories, uh, all the way up until the 19, uh, the 1868, 1869, um, but then there was slowly drawing back of forces because of growing number of Southern Democrats winning elections and getting back into D.C. and thus stripping power away from the federal government in order to reverse many of the um, gains that was to have been that would have come naturally due to the Civil War. And so you had a lot of the first Republican um, African American lawmakers coming about you know, shortly after the Civil War. They typically only serve one term or maybe two, and they get voted out and replaced with white Southern Democrats. And so all the reverses start happening very quite early. So by the time, really, of 1876 in American history, um, all of the gains that had been made because of the Civil War were completely reversed now by white Southern um, Democrat leaders who, re, you know, um, took back control of everything, took back control of all the state and, and government houses and re went about dismantling Lincoln's dream. And we start having the beginnings of the Jim Crow era started to happen the beginnings of the Ku Klux Klan starting to happen as well. And we start having a complete reverse reversal of American society. And so Mark Twain's novel 
was this satirization of all of these promises that weren't happening. And it was very much true in during this period known as the Gilded Age. And we will see how religion responds to this. And back to the economic prosperity mark of this, uh, what we see is after the um, you know 1870 really is around 1875 for this statistic um, that the wealthiest one percent of the American population had control over 27 percent of all of the wealth in the United States and that number will only increase as time goes on to one point by the time of the uh, really up until the time of well, some would say even up to now that we have the 1% controlling around 80% of all the wealth here in the United States. I would think that's a little too high, but I can say for sure at least 60 to 70%. Um, but it's a number that can, keeps going going up and up higher and higher. And so, of course, create, creates a level of in, uh, economic unprosperity. If only one percent of the population controls, you know, anywhere from seventy percent of the nation's entire wealth, that is a system that will fail. And so, what you get is somebody like the American economist at this time, a, a contemporary who was living during this time and writing for the New York, um, for writing for the New York-based paper Wall Street Journal. He was a uh, famed economist, William King, uh, Wilford King. And he noted at the time that the United States was, quote, becoming increasingly inegalitarian to such a point as that American exceptionalism, this idea that everyone can be free, everyone can make a living, everyone can prosper here in the United States, was becoming rapidly put to a risk. And that America was becoming more and more like the things that it had rebelled against was becoming more and more like Europe and falling away from its pioneering ideas that all men are created equal, that all men have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so he's writing this in the 1880s, and this is you know from the Wall Street Journal, uh, and he shows you time and time again that America is not the country in which we claim it to be, and that we need a revolution. And here, a little bit later, we're going to see one spark of this revolution happening in the terms of American religious um, experience here. But before that, we're going to talk about America, the changes in America and re religion's response to it in kind of this order. So we're going to start with the American experience out west and how religion responds out west. Second, we're going to talk about the massive amount of growth in the cities and, and the expansion of businesses and industry in America and how religion responds to that. And then finally, third, we're going to talk about um, the right, you know, because of urbanization and because of the expanse of American industrializations, they were being done on the back of immigrants. So we're going to talk about the immigrant experience in American religious context, but primarily, again, through the context of the American Catholic Church. Now, we can't talk about everybody in every religious context, but more specifically with the American Catholic Church, it's more significant because it'll come because the dialogue and the conflicts that happen that we will talk about will reappear again in the 1920s with Al Smith's U.S. presidency uh, candidate run that was a failure. Uh, because of anti-Catholic sentiments here in America, and then JFK and how JFK broke that trend finally, um, but then also with you know Vatican II that comes later in the 1960s, uh, that was very important because it was very much in my mind, um, very much spurred about because of the promises and the ideals and the things that were being pushed here in America, uh, that America's influences reverses. And has an effect on the on the Catholic Church on a global scale, and we'll talk about that here a little bit later. But first, let's talk about the West. So, the Church's expansion out west. So, there were really three major enticements uh, that drew people to the American uh, West. Uh, first, being gold mining. You know, in 1848, uh, there was the famous discovery of gold out in California. And so that's why the um, the football team there in, in San Francisco are known as the 49ers is a reference to the massive amount of migration out west due to the 1948 
uh, rumor of gold. And so you have a massive amount of people coming the following year in, in 1940 or in 1849. So that's the 49ers. Uh, and then later also in Alaska, the silver mines in Nevada in the 1870s, uh, silver mines in um, Arizona in the 1880s. And so and then Colorado, there were some silver mines there as well in the 1840s as well. So mining was a significant drive to many of the American states out west. Also, number two, because of the geography of the American West, particularly Montana, Wyoming, the Dakotas, um, significant portions of Colorado, Kansas, or, uh, uh, Nebraska, you know, out west in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, there were largely, you know, large flat areas of territory in which cattle and ranching could be done on a massive scale. Uh, because of the endless resources of free grass for cattle to range upon. And then the open territory, instead of having condensed areas, small acreages that like we have here in the American East, these you know Westerners could have massive amount of territories and thus can be able to have thousands upon thousands of cattle in these free ranging areas. And so cattle ranching was vastly important. And thus we created a new industry where now, you know, American cattlemen can get uh, uh, American beef uh, to markets much quicker on a much larger scale. And thus now American diets, American economics all start changing because of cattle and ranching. So a lot of people moved out west because of the third thing, too, that coincides with, with ranching and cattling, cheap land, very, very cheap land. Uh, the Homesteaders Act that was passed shortly after the Civil War um, that encouraged and spurred American um, people to move out west that they could buy huge tracts of land for very, very cheap that they could buy, um, I think it was 10, 10 to 15 acres of land um, anywhere in between there for about 10 to $15. So it's a dollar per acre, which was a steal. Even though for rate of inflation, it's still much of a steal back in, there. Uh, so a lot of people took advantage of moving out west. But however, even after the Civil War with the Homesteader Acts in 1872 and then later in 1880s, uh, the Homesteader Acts still forbid uh, uh, African Americans from participating out west. So this typically only white Americans were able to enjoy the Western experiences. You, you have to wait. African Americans typically have to wait until the 1920s where um, LA becomes a, a territory for African Americans to seek refuges because of the, the second wave of persecution that emerges, um, second wave of the Ku Klux Klan emerging and so you have a lot of Western, you know, African Americans moving out west by the 1920s, and then of course with the Great Depression, a lot of people moved out west because of the Dust Bowl era in the 1930s, and, the, and California was able to escape much of the famine that was happening out west. But this was a major draw for people, and so because of that. Because of this draw of gold mining, cattle ranching, cheap land, establishing churches in the American West was it's extremely difficult enterprise, even more so difficult than those in the frontier that helped spur the Second Great Awakening. Um, if you recall in the Second Great Awakening, there was this great fear among Eastern Christians and Eastern religious institutions on the Eastern coast, not Eastern like Buddhism or Hinduism, but East Coast regional uh, religious institutions had this great fear that people in the, the American Midwest or the Ohio River Valleys, Tennessee River Valleys, Mississippi River Valleys, that by moving out you know, towards the Midwest, that they would become barbarous, so that they would become paganized once again. And so there was this great urge, um, but typically because of you know most people settled in these areas like the Ohio River Valley, Tennessee River Valley, Mississippi River Valley, uh, rivers became quick ways for uh, industrialization. People tended to you know live around rivers and and you know um, establish settlements in large urban cities around rivers. So that's why you have 
cities like New Orleans on the Mississippi River, Memphis on the Mississippi River, St. Louis on the Mississippi River, Minneapolis on the you know, uh, Mississippi River. You have you know cities like Cincinnati uh, in Louisville in Kentucky on the Ohio rivers. You know, massive cities like you know Knoxville, Nashville on the Tennessee River. Uh, so again, you and then you know even further south in Alabama, like Muscle Shoals, that are on one of the tributaries of of these rivers, as well. So you know, establishing churches became a quite easier because people were willing to congregate themselves. But out in the American West, uh, there was no such thing. There wasn't a lot of river basins, like you know, except the Colorado River. Um, but not a lot of river basins, so a lot of people were very much spread out and scattered. And also because of the nature of the jobs, gold mining. Gold mining is not a permanent, um, permanent job. It's very much, as I say here, a transient job. People, you know, would typically, you know, go to these gold mines in small villages would set up in California. But if there was no gold, there's no point in staying in these little small villages. They would go wherever they could find the gold. And so towns were only spro you know, sprained up where they could find the gold. And sometimes these towns were in very much problematic areas to reach because of where you know the, the, the gold was fi found in many of these high mountains or in these crevices. So it made establishing churches or really communities very harsh. And very hard to do. And of course, cattle ranching, the nature of cattle ranching was free roaming. So again, there wasn't a lot of cities out in the American West. So establishing churches in the American West was very, very, very difficult and very problematic and happened extremely late because it needed technology. It needed the railroads to actually happen. And so we have some diaries of many of these early missionaries that went out to the American West. And I, you know, we have a famous diary here that I mentioned of G.A. Reeder, who was a famed Methodist minister in uh, Yuma, Arizona. And he records in his diaries various attempts to hold church meetings, to hold, you know, areas and try to build local churches early on. And he was woefully, woefully unsuccessful in his attempts in the 1840s and even up until the 1850s, uh, that people just were not interested in churches. It was very hard to hold churches, very hard to finance churches, uh, because again, populations constantly changed. If there was a significant drought at, you know, in the area, t people typically left because they couldn't grow any crops. Um, and cattle ranchers, again, they're always on the move. Miners, always on the move. And so it was very difficult. But however, uh, during about uh, 1853, uh, Reader notes in his diary that he begins to be successful. He finally finds a successful winning campaign in order to establish churches and actually have and win congregants. And what he talks about in his diary is that he teamed up with local bars. That at the time in the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church and the Presbyterian Church in the 1840s, uh, there was a growing movement towards temperance of alcohol. And that was very successful out, out in the American East. And so these churches began to be anti-alcohol in their stance and their traditions. But how, however, out West, for reader, for the church to succeed, it had to change its stance on alcohol. And so he changed his stance on alcohol and thus started to hold church services at local bars on Saturday, on Sunday. The bar would close for that day. They would hold a, a revival service in the bar. And then, the, you know, after the revival service, the church service, the bar would open for, you know, happy hour. And it, his churches were very much successful. And so he would teamed up with these local bars. And sometimes many of these local bars had you know, prostitution, you know, had local, um, uh, ah, the word is escaping me here, brothels attached to the bars in order to, you know, because these ranchers and these men, you know, these gold miners had money. And so uh, really bars and prostitutions established the American West. And so Reader had to change his stance on many of these issues and, and for, for order to be successful. So the American churches out west were very much liberal, 
versus those out in the American East that they saw, um, you know, the the issue of sex, you know, sex outside the bonds of marriage as a gray area. Um, many of these churches, in order to succeed, the issues of alcohol were either just completely ignored or just issues as a gray area, so the churches could prosper. But how are Reader's model wasn't very successful because, again, once a new missionary would come out from the east and they would see what Reader and his churches and his congregations were doing, that they were being, you know, little devils on Saturdays getting drunk, whoring around, and then on Sunday they're meeting for communion. Um, there was a lot of criticism, so a lot of fighting between, you know, churches that were succeeding out west at this time and those, you know, missionaries coming from the east who didn't understand the, the, the nature of, of the American West and the culture that Reed ha Reader had to change to, to fit and model with. So eventually, it really takes until the 1870s for the uh, churches or the religious context of the American, you know, um, East and the American cent Central uh, uh, Southern states and Central states to make its way out West and society to make its way out West. And so to reach these communities, Protestant missionaries in the 1870s and 80s had to develop new techniques and embrace new technologies. And so the when they started to become popular and started to have success, it was one tied with the railroads. And so um, the first person to have success was an actual, an Episcopal, Episcopal bishop who was posted, uh, he was posted out in the Dakotas, I think in North Dakota uh, and Montana area. And he was charged by the Episcopal um, Church to create a diocese out in the American West. But um, while he was out there, he was extremely unsuccessful. But uh, William David Walker, um, he met, uh, he was aware of Russian, the Russian church experiencing a sense of revival out in Siberia. Well, and so he traveled out there, he visited Siberia, talked with the Russian Orthodox Church out there, and what he saw was is that the Orthodox Church was, were teaming up with the local uh, railroad constructions. That the, you know, the, the imperial state of Russia was trying to build a railroad that would cross from, you know, all the way from Moscow all the way to Japan or Korea, and was going, you know, across the entire length of, of the continent. And so going through Siberia and how the churches were, you know, how the Russian Orthodox Church was revived, you know, being experiencing revival and there was growth of salvations and conversions was that they had railroad carts that they had converted into small chapels. And so as the railroad was expanding, the chap, the, the, basically the chapel would move with it on a railroad cart. And so they experienced a lot of great revival. And so William David Walker saw that idea and he said, I'm going to take it back to America. And so he wrote a letter to one of the rich um, um, millionaires in American history, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Uh, Vanderbilt University is named after him. Um, you know, the famous Vanderbilts who built, you know, um, uh, built more out in Asheville, North Carolina, or have the Vanderbilt estate still in, in um, uptown New York. Uh, you know, Cornelius was the father of, of the Vanderbilt family, but he made all of his money on shipbuilding as well as railroad building. And he was a prominent Methodist too, and, and, and uh, donated a lot of resources, a lot of money to the Methodist church. And so Methodists and Episcopals are very similar uh, and so William David Walker wrote to Cornelius and told him about his idea and, and how to ex help expand his, you know, Vanderbilt's railroads is that what if we had a, you would design for me a railroad cart that was made, you know, from a chapel, made to be into a chapel where there was pews, that there would be an altar. As you can see up here, this is an example of a Catholic altar. But it was there was an altar up front, and then there would be local pews or chairs in which the congregants could sit and listen to the sermon. And so, of course, C C Cornelius loved this because he saw it as a use for advertisement. And so he started building and designing these purpose-built railroad carts. Um, but 
the real success came from actually Baptist um, businessmen, uh, Baptist businessmen in Minnesota who saw uh, Walker's idea of a with, with how Walker called it a cathedral car, and so they decided to build for themselves a company that would create chapel cars for all denominations and they were very successful and so they rephrased it as railroad chapel cars and they built um 27 of them uh this the small business uh i forget they were brothers i forget their names but they were two brothers i think millers if i remember right and they built all you know 27 of these design chapel cars and they were cross-denominational. They built ones, you know, specifically for Baptist and Methodist. They built some with Episcopals and Catholics in mind because of the nature of having an altar. Um, uh, and so they were very successful. And so this is how the church started to become successful. Is that it was tied to the railroad. And so as the railroad progressed, because there was no cities, the church would move along with it. And so it was very successful for a long period of time. Uh, but however, because, you know, with the, the development of railroads that you start having railroad trading posts and you have cities that are starting to develop, that due to the lack of, coming, of permanent social structures, so being hospitals, schools, colleges, orphanages, or even social dance halls, for the American West, the American churches begin to fill in those, in those gaps creating denominational schools, uh, high schools, elementary schools that would serve, that would later be converted into public schools much, much later, or colleges. So many of the, you know, so for example, many of the great Western universities out West are typically religious denominational schools. So, you know, um, in Texas, you know, uh, uh, TCU, Texas Christian University, a great fine higher educational school in Fort Worth. It's a Christian school made by the Christian denomination. Uh, you know, uh, SMU there in Fort Worth, Texas is, are in Dallas as well. Southern Methodist University. Uh, Baylor University, a Baptist university there in Waco, Texas. A, you know, Baptist institution. Uh, university of, of Southern California, USC, the Fighting Trojans. They were originally, they're a private school still, but they were originally a Methodist university. Uh, Wesleyan College out in or Oregon, you know, that's a hotbed now of, of liberalism, but it was a Methodist univers university in Portland, Oregon. BYU, you know, Brigham Young University is a Mormon university. So a lot of these major universities and sources predominant universities out in the American out west were all established as denominational schools and then again many of the hospitals so in, in a lot of the hospitals uh, um, in San Francisco uh, Los Angeles Salt Lake Utah um, Temple uh, Tempe Arizona are still tied to denominational services out there whether Catholic hospitals or Methodist or Baptist hospitals um, you know, the largest hospital in the state of Texas there in Houston is Methodist Hospital. Um, you know, it's funded and run by the Methodist Church. Um, Baylor University has many hospitals um, in Dallas and Houston area, as well as Austin. They're run by a Baptist organization. So again, uh, many of the social institutions that we take for granted in the American East out in the American West, it was the churches that ha that filled in those gaps, and so thus the churches helped to establish a Western civilization out in the American West. But also for the churches to succeed, even more so out West, they they had to become more and more what is known as non-denominational. So the term non-denominational first inferred to meaning that there wasn't a set ideology that the church was going to be run under, whether it was Presbyterian, Methodist, or Baptist, or Catholic. Um, well, there's no such thing as a non-denominational Catholic church, but um, particularly the Protestant ones like Presbyterians and Methodists and, and Baptists. Um, the reason for that was that their ministers might be Baptist in their training, their, or Methodist in their training and in their ideology, but because the audience was a, a makeup of whatever minister that they could get, 
So the church's organizational styles, um, their doctrine or the theology tended to be neutral in order to reach a mass, you know, a larger amount of audiences and also to um, grow. So you might have a Baptist minister and a Baptist minister who might believe in, you know, rebaptizing uh, people uh, or baptism by confession. You might have a Baptist minister that believes in local autonomy of the church, but because of the congregation is primarily all Presbyterian or all Methodist, Methodists have different beliefs that they believe that baptism should happen, you know, when a child is, you know, christened and when a child is still a baby. And so the Baptist minister, instead of saying, well, this is what I believe and you got to believe it too, he would typically say, okay, and he would perform the ceremony in the Methodist way. But yet he might still be a Baptist minister by training. So that's what I mean by non-denominational is because the congregation was so wide in its beliefs and its audiences that certain denominational practices become null and void. And so you just had simple churches that had, you know, a wide range of beliefs and characters that would come into these areas. And so non-denominational churches become very popular in the American West. But then as typical with anything in pop culture, when it starts in the West, it slowly makes its way back East. And so now today, non-denominational churches are extremely popular among American youth uh, because of that fact that there's not these denominational hang-ups that typical um, people you know, of a certain age don't really like. But also, too, many of these churches had to experience, um, they had, you know, churches had to, to be successful out West. Let me rephrase it this way. To be successful out West in the American West, typically the leader, the pastor, the minister had to have care, uh, either a charismatic style about himself or a charismatic style about his style of preaching and techniques in order to draw people and influence people. So there's these typical great ministers out in the American West, Charles Sheldon, Sheldon Jackson, Father Dyer, and um, Brother Van Dorsel of the Lutheran Church, that they had different contexts. So for example... Uh, Sheldon Jackson, uh, he was a local Methodist minister, and how he um, grew churches is out in Alaska. He, you know, uh, received a lot of fame for uh, for being out in Alaska. It was that he, instead of being a minister and having the career as an minister, he would take up odd jobs within odd communities. So I have a picture of him down here. That here's. Um, uh, Sheldon Jackson's right here in the middle. He took a, for this picture, he took a job as a tax collector aboard a ship in Alaska. The USS or the USRC, which is United States Revenue Cutter uh, Bear, in which that it was a ship that would go out, you know, and um, inspect um, product that was coming to America to be traded between Russia and Alaska. Uh, and also to protect trade as well as a cutter that and so ships protect from pirates. And so he served on the ship in order to minister to people and create churches in these areas because uh, um, because the American West was, again, more transient in its people. So he took odd jobs. So one being this tax collector uh, on aboard a job aboard a ship that was designed to protect tax trade. He also um he became a, um, a logger for a railroad company, um, cutting down trees in order to make railroads into certain areas up in Alaska. So again, he was, you know, took these odd jobs in order to minister to people and create churches as he would go along. And so he was very famous and he's actually mentioned in Jack Doyle's book, um, call to the wild, uh, has a reference to Sheldon Jackson and his character. So he was a very popular person. Uh, Charleston, uh, Charles Sheldon uh, was very important because he actually wrote books. And so instead of preaching sermons to his congregations, he would write fiction novels and, and have reading ceremonies, or, or not reading ceremonies, but reading clubs. 
he established reading clubs um, where he would read trans, you know, um, uh, first rough drafts of his books to local people, but they were very much Christian fiction or Christian, you know, um, Christian, um, yeah, not um, fiction books and his Christian stories where he would use elements of the Bible to tell a story in order to reach people for his book club. And so he later becomes a pastor, but he kept that technique going on that he would write fiction books. And then so he would instead of preaching sermons as he would you know tell stories or read stories from his book that were very, you know based off the Bible or based off Christian principles in order to reach people. Uh, and then, you know, Father Dyer was a Catholic uh, uh, minister who was very popular uh, because he was also a, a U.S. Marshal, too, uh, out in Montana. And so he was a Catholic priest and a U.S. Marshal. And so you can see again how people you know were able to uh, these a lot of these ministers that were very famous and grew crowds of people, they were uncharacteristic. To what we see out in the the American East, where you know the minister had to be scholarly and his ideas, or had to be confined to a church, you know, church building. Out in the American West, many of these ministers were not, but they also had different charismatic styles of teaching and, and worship and our presentations. And so I wanted to show you this uh, video clip um, from. Um, you know, David Day Lewis's movie, uh, There Will Be Blood, about a church service out in the... Finish the school year strong with fully accredited online courses from Keystone. Over 160... Touch this woman with your hands and caress her. Yes. My dear Mrs. Hunter, you have arthritis, don't you? Yes, I do, love. Yes, the devil is in your hands and I will fuck it out. Now, I will not cast this ghost out with a fever. For the new spirit inside me has shown me I have a new way to communicate. It is a gentle whisper. Get out of here, ghost. Get out of here, ghost. Get out. Get out of here, ghost. Get out of here. Don't you dare turn around and come back. For if you do, all oh, the armies of my boot will kick you in the teeth. And you will be cast up and thrown in the dirt and thrust back to partition. And as long as I have teeth, I will bite you. And if I have no teeth, I will gum you. And as long as I have fish, I will bash you now. Get out of your house. Get out of your house. Get out of your house. Yeah, it's a little brief uh, video from that movie. Um, but you can see the charismatic style, something completely different, particularly in this instance, claims of healing, divine healing, was very powerful out in the, in the American West because of this, you know, I don't want to characterize all people that moved out West as being very superstitious. But because of the nature of where they were living, they tended to be more superstitious. And so there was lots of claims of divine healing that a lot of ministers would do in order to gain an attraction. So that's what, for example, Brother Van, 
Van Orsel, that's what he did, was claim that he had, you know, divine powers that he could be able to kill people in order to, you know, grow a crowd. And we'll talk about that later with the healing movements within Christianity and the religious movements, um, new religious movements like Christian sciences and whatnot, or even Pentecostalism. That becomes a key aspect of their claim in a way they can draw audiences is of divine healing. So we have elements of that out West in order to grab, you know, to draw a crowd because these people in the American West, they can be doing other stuff, protecting their homestead, protecting, you know, growing crops, working the fields, but instead to draw a crowd, you need to be more inviting. You need to be more exciting. And so thus new techniques of preaching or new techniques of Christianity and how we do religion develops and so one of those being the he, you know divine healing claims that many of these ministers claim they had um so next i want to talk about out in the american west some kind of reactions that happen to you know more and more people coming out west so for this particular part i want to talk about um mormonism and kind of revisit mormonism because where we left off earlier we left off with the emergence of, of Joseph Smith as, uh, as one of our discussions about the new religious movements that spurred out of the Second Great Awakening. And one of those key ones being a Mormonism that still has survived. And so today we're going to pick up where Joseph Smith had um, where we left off with Joseph Smith. And so we talked about how Joseph Smith, you know, died, um, um, was uh executed or was martyred however phrase you want to put it and uh are murdered in um 1846 and so the community was left in a tussle uh the community was divided among mormon leadership you know should the the mantle pass to joseph smith's sons or should it be passed to a more mature older leader and the community was kind of divided but eventually the the mantle of leadership was passed to one of joseph smith's closest companions and one of his uh, members of his cabinet uh in brigham young and so brigham young took control of the community he reorganized its leadership from being a leadership where it, the power was centralized to a divine you know this kind of prophet like figure that joseph smith was and claimed to be to now a leadership that was run by a kind of committee of eldermen um in the church but they still had a ceo or a president in that case being brigham young and so he reorganized the leadership and he migrated, he started the migration of the Mormon community away from Navajo in Illinois in 1846. The church needed to escape again more uh, levels of persecution. And so in order to do that, they have to f move further and further out west. So eventually um, the Mormon church moved to the Utah Territory. Um, not the, you know, the state of Utah, but the territory of Utah, but also included territories uh, in Arizona, Nevada, Idaho, to some extent, and parts of California. So these new territories that were being carved out, but yet were not a state. And so thus, the Mormon community was not really in America at one point. They moved out to the, the fringes of American society and more so into the Mexican side of of society in order to escape persecution and thus they were on the outside of the boundaries of the united states and were able to succeed and so you start having various mormon communities being established the city of salt lake utah logan utah mesa arizona idaho falls idaho the city of las vegas and San Bernardino, California, were all cities created and established and founded, and for a significant portion of their history, run by the Mormon Church for a very long time. Uh, and so this is where the Mormon community thought that they would be safe, that they would be outside the boundaries of the United States, that they would succeed on the very edges of the Mexican territory, where the Mexican government would really just care less about these settlements further out west. But however, there, you know, the United uh, Brigham Young and his leadership was a little short-sighted because he couldn't predict what would happen with the American-Mexican War in, in 1846 to 1848. And the U.S. was very successful in this war. In part of the Treaty of Guadalupe uh, Hidalgo, the United States was able to gain the, you know, the modern-day states of Utah 
in much of the territory in the American Southwest. So New Mexico, you know, parts of New Mexico and Arizona and parts of California, all of the you know, states of Nevada. Um, and uh, later on, you know, the, they would uh, the United States would gain uh, through the Gaston Purchase in the, in the 1920s, they'd gain more territory in Southern California, Arizona, and New Mexico to finally complete those states. But however, the United States had won control over Utah, and so the Mormon community was very concerned again that they would face persecution once again, that they had escaped persecution in New York, had escaped persecution in Utah, I mean, in Ohio and in Missouri and then in Illinois and in Nebraska. And then now and they were facing it once again in Utah. So Brigham Young very quickly sent a delegation of Mormons to uh, to Washington, D.C. in order to negotiate with the federal government control by the Mormons to con be able to control the territory of Utah. Um, at the time. And so Congress actually agreed because of what was going on that typically at this time, uh, Congress allowed many denominations to take control of many aspects of the American uh, Southwest. And so this was actually a common practice. And so the United States Congress was allowing many of these churches to kind of do the dirty work of establishing, like we already showed, establishing social orders and social institutions in which the federal government wouldn't have to. Things like schools, hospitals, orphanages, uh, communities, things like that. And so the, the Congress was very willing to do it. However, um, Congress didn't give uh, Brigham Young everything he wanted. Brigham Young wanted the entire new territory to be governed by the Mormon church, but instead only a small territory within the state of Utah was given control to the Mormon church. And that was okay. You know, uh, Brigham Young did agree. And thus, Utah, the Utah's territory, was run as a Mormon theocratic state for several decades, in which the Mormon church controlled all aspects of social society. The, the Mormon church appointed their own judges to serve in federal courts, um, in, you know, uh, they, you know, appointed their own police to, uh, uh, policing, they, their own mayors, their own hospitals, everything was run by the Mormon church. And this arrangement was okay for several decades. Uh, but in 1855 and, um, in through the entire year of 1856, uh, the Mormon community started to experience out in Utah, a massive amount, uh, a significant drought in the area and then it was compl uh, complicated even more so when a massive infestation of grasshoppers came to the territory and started eating up and desolating much of the crops that were being grown out in the territories and so thus basic necessities like bread flour uh, to even a point water became very scarce for the Mormon church and the Mormon community so you can go back and read many of these uh, diaries kept by Mormon um, these uh, Mormon people during this period and it was very very um, troublesome period like you can read I remember reading one story that people were trading you know um, money that they, they, they you know they would say their money was completely worthless that at one point that you know twenty dollars was nothing. Um, no one would take money that, you know, it was all about goods that, you know, goods and values. Flour became more, uh, more of a, a important commodity than money and actually became money at one point in time, how bad the, the, uh, the drought was. And so various Mormon communities started to die off at this time. But however, in September of 1856, uh, one of the preachers, um, a Mormon kind of preacher, um, kind of the Mormon, well, he was a, really an elder, but he acted like a preacher because it said Mormon church really doesn't have preachers. Um, but they, they have elders. And so one of the elders of a local community, uh, Jedediah Grant, um, he strongly believed that God was punishing the Mormon community because the Mormon community was no longer as faithfully observing the doctrines and the teachings that Joseph Smith had once preached and believed in. 
So thus, in turn, what, what happened was is that Jedediah Grant uh, launched a three-day revival at his local congregation there in Kaysville, Utah. And uh, the revival grew. It, it grew to uh, several months long revival. And more and more Mormon leaders and, and Mormon communities, the revival began to spread. And the revival was started as a call for repentance, but also a general recommitment to Mormon morality and Mormon teachings. And so this period um, in 1856 became known as the Mormon Reformation within Mormon history. And so it sparked a revival and the Mormon church went through a series of changes. And so the community became more charismatic in its teachings and its practices and its worships. Uh, and they also instituted new practices that become somewhat standard in Mormon churches today. So one of these was the, pra the practice of rebaptism. So it's very similar to um, the baptisms that are be that are done by the Baptist Church, in which you know full immersion, and that a person instead of being sprinkled with water as a sign of being saved by grace. Um, for the Baptist church, the, the, you know, they would immerse an adult usually, um, sometimes a teenager, but more specifically during this time, it was always an adult. It was a belief that you had to be an adult in order to experience baptism among a Baptist community. Um, but baptism was a sign of repentance, not so much a sign of conversion, um, but a sign of repentance and rededication. So the Mormon church took this same practice and so rebaptism becomes a sign of rededication. So even though somebody could already be baptized within the community, many people were becoming rebaptized as confessing sins or as a sign of rededication. And eventually, the act of rebaptism in the Mormon Church begins to spread to other aspects. So sometimes, uh, if a person gets elected to be a elder within the church, he will undergo the practice of rebaptism as again a sign of recommitment or sometimes married couples people that are getting married within the mormon church will undergo rebaptism as again a sign of recommitment to god and recommitment to each other so baptism becomes morphed within the mormon church and becomes more a sign of recommitment to god than so much confession of sins or initial conversion to uh, to mormonism or to Christianity. Uh, and so you have the practice of rebaptism. And then also you had a controversial practice that put the Mormon church along with the practice of polygamy on the outskirts of American society. And that was the development of a more, the Mormon doctrine of blood atonement. Now, really since the 1970s, blood atonement hasn't been practiced within the Mormon church. Uh, however, I have seen it once uh, when I was in Canada, I traveled to a Mormon community. When I was living in Vancouver, I traveled to a Mormon community uh, in Idaho. Um, and, I, and I witnessed someone who had already on, undergone, um, who, who believed in the practice of blood atonement. Um, but what blood atonement was, it was this belief that, um, particularly among the elders of the church, but, I've, but for like this guy that I saw, um, sometimes head of households, so sometimes the male figure of a household. It was the belief that in order to have true forgiveness of sin, that there needed to be a blood atonement, similarly to what Christ, that Christ had died on the cross in order to have the forgiveness of our sins as individuals. For the Mormon church, and for some of these Mormons, it was that every time sin was committed on a larger scale, and a community was suffering punishment is because God required a blood atonement. So thus, in turn, many of like the church elders, sometimes the leaders of the Mormon church on a larger scale, but then on an individual scale, sometimes head of households, so male figures, would purposely cut themselves in order to, quote unquote, give a blood atonement for the sins of the community of the church or of the family in response to God's practices um, or God, you know, in response to God for, for God's forgiveness for his chastisement upon you. And so this, this became a, a, a practice within the Mormon church that they would have ceremonies in which people would cut themselves and bleed 
you know, in large quantities, um, you know, for the forgiveness of sin. So it's typically church leaders. Um, but then, like I said, I have seen it um, where it was head of households who have done this. And so uh, the Mormon church drew a lot of ire among the outside communities because of this, that they are cutting themselves willy nilly. And at, and typically it was done during this time in charismatic form. So people, you know, you know, shouting, singing, dancing, and they would be people cutting themselves. So it looked very scary to very, you know, you know, prominent, sit back, relax, no emotion style Protestant churches or Catholic churches that you normally see. This was something completely different. So it was a practice that drew a lot of ire among um, white evangelicals or white Christians uh, in these communities. And so Mormons uh, outside of polygamy also drew more and more uh, hatred because of this kind of practice of seeing of being of the devil or being of witchcraft and stuff like that. But also during this period, shortly after the Mormon Reformation, uh, the Mormon church found itself in armed conflict with the U.S. government. Yes, the Mormon church and the United States government went to war with each other very briefly, uh, known in history as the Utah War. Um, we don't talk about it much because it was very much lacklustered um, in that there wasn't many, um, there wasn't, you know, there was only one conflict and uh, there wasn't really large scale engagements, but it was uh, a proxy war in a lot of sense. But the Mormon church was at odds with the U.S. government and the U.S. government declared war on the Mormon church and vice versa. And so this was in 1857 and 1858. And so President Buchanan, um, the 15th president of the United States, actually sent armed forces into Utah in order to quell the growing power of the Mormon church and Mormon hostilities within the territory. And so what was happening was that the Mormon church actually had their own army known as the Utah Territory Militia. They actually had their own army. Um, Joseph Smith led the, his own army in Illinois, the, the Navajo Legion as well. Um, Brigham Young had an army of Mormons uh, in Utah as well, the, the Utah Militia. And they were purposely not allowing people to trespass or traverse the ter the Utah Territory. You know, travelers who were going on to Oregon or going on to California, uh, they were prevented by the, the the Mormon army from going into, you know, from passing their territory. They, they had to go around the ter you know, around the Mormon community um, and sometimes risk further danger by armed uh, Native American conflicts or attacks. Uh, so the United States government wanted to force uh, the Mormon church to put down their army, in a sense, because they were, um, you know, with armed guns preventing people from crossing into their territory. And there was one incident um, known as the Mountain Meadows Massacre in which the, you know, a Mor Mormon community uh, had fired upon and killed innocent people who were just simply traveling uh, onto uh, Oregon. Uh, and so this sparked a lot of conflict. But again, there was no major battles because uh, the more and um, the Mormon, like I have here, the Mormon militia did massacre um, a few of the uh, migrating parties to California or Oregon. Um, I think in total around 200 people were killed. Um, they, they were travelers. Uh, but there was no major battles. Typically, the Mormon um, army kept uh, blocking um, passageways and would prevent the army, the United States Army, from going into Utah. And so they would block, you know, uh, uh, either block passageways physically with their own army or they would block passageways with boulders or rocks, forcing the armies to go all the way around. So it was, there was never any major battle. However, there was open conflict between them. And so really from this time on, the United States government had a hostile, hostile view towards the Mormon church because the Mormon church did take up arms against American citizens and were willing to fight the American army if they actually you know, ever fought in open conflict. 
But even though the United States was able to sue for peace, and part of that peace was removing Young, Brigham Young, as governor of the territory of Utah and setting up a secular governor, um, it did mark the start of a systematic effort by the United States government to uh, curtail Mormon influences and the, more, and the influences of the Mormon church in the American West. And, and more specifically, uh, for the Republican uh, National Party, uh, every uh, Republican president ran on the platform of ending the practice of polygamy uh, or bigamy sometimes uh, in uh, the Mormon community. And so you had a series of laws being passed during Republican controlled uh, Congresses. So during Abraham Lincoln's uh, uh, administration, you had the, the, the Morrell anti polygamy act in which made polygamy or bigamy a uh, federal offense that was um, prosecuted in courts and could uh, up to uh, 14 years in jail uh, in 1862 the poland act in, in 1874 um, and then also you had the edmund acts and, and later on that uh, made that compelled I think it was the Edmund Act in 1882 actually compelled women, uh, marriage couple, married couples, that they had to testify under penalty of oath. And if they did not testify against their husbands, uh, you know, in, in open court, that they could go to jail, I think, for four years uh, so that forced women and these polygamy marriages to testify against their husbands. Uh, so the United States government purposefully attacked the Mormon church. Ultimately, this is what I want you to get, that in the way that they created laws specifically aimed at Mormons and Mormon practices in order to downput Mormon, the Mormon influences in the out west. Uh, the last Edmund Act in 1887, if I remember right, uh, you know, removed Mormon judges that, you know, any judge that professed belief in Mormonism couldn't be a federal judge. Uh, which that's a little unconstitutional, but it, it was upheld uh, that the, the, the Mormon church couldn't have any power or say over federal appointments as well as they had previously. So, oops, I don't know what happened here. Let me go back. Yeah. And um, so, again, the church, you know, was being attacked. So eventually um, in 1890, uh, um, shortly after you had um, F United States versus uh, Ferguson's, uh, um, no, Reynolds, sorry, United States versus Reynolds, the U.S. Supreme Court in which it ruled polygamy was unconstitutional and did in that um, laws passed against polygamy was not uh, against the Second Amendment. Uh, you had eventually in 1890 with the uh, uh, one of the presidents, uh, Woodrow, uh, well, Wolfold Woodruff, uh, you know, received a revelation from God in which called for the end of polygamy uh, as being a church doctrine of the Mormon church. And so thus, really, since 1890, um, polygamy has been outlawed by the Mormon church. However, there are segments of more of uh, there are sectarian groups of the Mormon Church who who in fact do believe in polygamy uh, and do practice polygamy uh, under the uh, you know under the radar uh, from American government uh, and they're particularly around U uh, Idaho communities that you do get to see them um, and some areas of Utah as well but there are sectarian groups that 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 the, the head the main Mormon church in, Utah, in Salt Lake doesn't recognize them as Mormons, but they do. But these sectarian groups do claim that they're Mormons, uh, but they operate outside the, the Mormon church. Um, but, however, with the, rec uh, the recent state, you know, uh, marriage equality acts, where you know gay marriage is now legal in the United States, and the in the, in the, uh, the 2013 U.S. Supreme Court that ruled. Um, gay marriages were constitutional that now you're starting to see in the America the um, Mormon church that they're starting to put together legal cases um, in order to fight back for the act of polygamy again 
So we'll see if that ever resurfaces again. But like I said, there is a growing movement within the Mormon community and even the mainstay Mormon community to have polygamy come back again because of the issue of gay marriage uh, in America. So we'll see. But however, this is where the kind of the Mormon church ends, that, they, they rec that their power is gravely curtailed in the, the um, Utah territory. And once Utah becomes a state, um, the Mormon church is significantly weakened. But um, it does resurface eventually in the 1950s uh, and becomes kind of a um, really by the time of Roe v. Wade, and the pushback um, that you have among evangelicals now, the Mormon church is now an acceptable Christian denomination because of the issue of abortion, which uh, Mormons are very much anti-abortion. And because of that, a lot of evangelical Christians that once saw the Mormons as questionable, um, they now look at them as, oh, they are Christians as well because of this issue. And then also you have some success with uh, Mick Romney's presidential campaign in 2012 that helped um, grow the Mormon church to be seen as legitimate once again. All right, so now we're going to look at the uh, Native American reaction to the movements out west. So as Western movements insu uh, you know, ensured, um, Western movements of, Amer of, p of populations out and further and further west really ensured that difficult encounterments would occur between these Euro-American immigrants and Native Americans. And still, even in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, uh, Euro-Americans still viewed, um, and why I say Euro-Americans, because I'm talking about immigrants who had come to America as well, first-generation uh, immigrants as well. So these immigrants, um, as well as normal white uh, Americans still viewed Indians as pagans, as savages. And so thus the government um, continuously would continue the practice of resettlement of Native American populations in, in ways to confine Native Americans away from white people and away from Western civilizations. And so you had the, you know, the United States government sending out the cavalry in order to quell down, push, to maintain, to control, and to keep Native American populations within these reservations and, and, and thus allow white civilization to prosper in these areas. And one of the most unpopular decisions that occurred, and a, and a massive tragedy as well, was in 1869, the Federal uh, Board of Indian Commissioners began, and so this is in, the, in Washington, D.C., began the practice of establishing what they called, quote-unquote, Indian boarding schools um, out west and also back out east in the American East as well. And the sole purposes of these boarding schools was to assimilate uh, in Native American children and youth towards the American culture. And so what happened was is that the federal government claimed power over the Native American populations that the federal government could walk onto many of these reservations and confiscate Native American children and take them, remove them from the communities, and thus they would live in these boarding schools uh, in which they would be educated. And this is what the federal government told them. said, oh, your children are going to be educated. They're going to learn a skill. And then when they come back to you, that they're going to be productive citizens in your societies. But however, typically when they came back to the villages, they were completely Americanized. Um, many of the, the, the Native American children were assimilated, became Christians, um, you know, were prevented from continuing their practices to, um, uh, you know, of Native cultures and dresses, and they became more and more Americanized. Um, and typically, some of these youth never went back to their native uh, villages as well. They would continue on and to go into the big cities and work jobs and stuff like that. And thus, Native American practices and cultures were being lost because of forced assimilation. And at the same time, the government welcomed Christian missionaries into becoming de facto governors of these Indian reservation communities. And so the federal government gave many of these uh, Christian missionaries power 
to confiscate these children in order to establish, you know, uh, these little uh, boarding schools. And so I have this, you know, famous picture of here of a boarding school in Indiana uh, or in Pennsylvania in 1902. And so you can see there's, I think it's over 700 Native American children that were all kidnapped, really in a way, from their territories. But they were, you know, being forced to be compelled, where the Native American parents had to give up their children for a significant period of time in order to be educated. But typically, these children would come back. And they were Americanized. You can see they're all wearing dresses. They're all, you know, the boys are all wearing little suits. They all look alike, but they, none of them look Native American in their dress and their contacts. And this was the purpose. The purpose was to kill the Indian in such a sense. And so this is advocated in, in a, a, a campaign during the whole 1870s, 1880s, throughout the 1890s. Uh, a, a, an American campaign that was going on. And one of the, the key ringleaders was a U.S. military official, Richard Henry Pratt, who would go on these speaking tours, who was an advocate supporter of these Indian boarding schools. And in one of his, um, and in one of his uh, speeches, he, he, here he records that he avidly stressed that only, quote, or, quote, fully alienating Indians from their tribal superstitions and immersing them in a Christian education and social environment through force, acculturalization, uh, 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 could they be transformed from savages to Americans? And so that's, this was the, the, the motto that was gone about during this period. It was almost like a bumper sticker, or you can see this being placed on little red hats that people would wear. Thus, the motto became kill the kill the indian save the man so kill the savage but save the man and so this became the dialogue this became the battle cry for most people during this period concerning native americans that they needed to be uh native american cultures needed to be wiped away and needed to be americanized in order to save them in order to civilize them so because of this deep cultural dislocation in government policy, what happened was is that you had Native Americans that in turn, it revitalized many Native American cultures and practices, and they used religion as a way to rally the troops and fight back in resistance. And so you have tribal communities, which was interesting. Um, we see tribal communities during this time that they start developing millennial ideologies as well and what i mean by that that they have the same ideas that many christians have about you know like the book of revelations that you know god jesus will come back that there'll be this massive battle the forces of good will defeat the forces of evil and everybody will be saved and everybody's singing kumbaya the same thing for the native americans that they start having these visions and start having these beliefs that you know they'll ultimately be this great battle that will happen and that ultimately all the white people will be defeated at the hands of the native americans or the hands of their native american gods and that they'll you know be a reversal and thus you know at this cosmic battle that they'll be um, everything will be restored as it once was in the beginning so you had many native american prophets using religion using the revival of native american cultures and in turn to create resistance movements. So in the Pacific Northwest, you had in the Washington uh, state area, the Wampapa prophet um, Sholoma, uh, who revived the Washahat religion that, was, that had almost completely been disintegrated because of these um, Indian boarding schools that had come about. And so he's in 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, uh, and the communities were being died out and being Christianized is that he forces Native Americans to abandon Christianity again in public dis uh, um, distributions and, and public displays and that they bring back Native dress, Native culture, Native tongues, Native speech, and then thus start to, you know, con uh, con conform a confederacy in order to fight the American government. And so in the late 1870s, you had a series of battles in which the U.S. government fought against the Native American population led by the Prophet Samoloha 
in Washington, but ultimately he was uh, unsuccessful in his battles or his uh, conflicts. But again, Native American resistance was tied to a revival of Native American religions and practices. And then the Pacific Southwest and, you know, in Nevada and, in, you know, in um, Arizona, New Mexico and Southern California, you had two prophets. Um, they were both father and sons, uh, Wobizawa and Wovaka, and who's more importantly Wovaka, who revived the traditional old ghost dance in Native American practices. And you can see here, this is a good video of the what it was the ghost dance as a revi as a resistance movement came to me when the sun went into shadow and i lay dying and in my death i saw the heavens of the white robe yes it is as they describe it but also there, my children, all the Indians that ever roamed this earth. All your beloved ancestors and mine, and those young ones who were taken by the white man's diseases. Do not grieve for them. They want you to know that they are happy. Yes. And you should not grieve for yourselves because here is what the white robes did not tell you. The white man, my children, will soon be no more. You must not hate the white man. This will only delay his end. But if you will do the dance that I will teach you, all the ancestors will return and the buffalo will be renewed and you shall all live forever, forever in the freedom that we as Indian people once knew. quick video of of what the ghost dance looked like and even some of the sermons of uh Wovaka and his ideology of what the ghost dance was now he represented something different because there was two streams of thought concerning the ghost dance and so one was people like uh, somaha who believed that the ghost dance was to bring about the spirits in order to help 
Native American cultures in order, our Native American people, in order to go out and do battle against the white man. And so Somaha used this as a way to rally the people, but then also strengthen them in order to get them prepared to do battle. And some of them were very successful. Some of the Native Americans were very successful in this. People like Sitting Bull, people like Geronimo. Well, he was Apache, but they would still do the ghost dance as well. Um, but it was this idea that if we revitalize, if we go back to the old culture, old practices of the Native Americans, it will uh, it will re empower us enable us to do battle but however Wovica was something a little bit different in his idea because you can see he's, he said in this his sermon there don't hate the white man because that will only enable or will only delay the inevitable and so it was this belief that the white man will eventually go away but it will only he'll only go away if we continue to do our practices and continue to do our traditions. But he advocated for nonviolence in a way as well. Wovica did. But this was his form of resistance. That the white man will go away if we stay native. If we stay true to our practices, if we keep doing our practices, that eventually the gods will hear us and they will save us. And so he, he never advocated for violence. And so, but however, you know, as that little screenshot was, that was right prior to the Battle of Wounded Knee. Uh, and Wovako was asking people not to go out and fight the Americans. But however, um, he didn't win in that argument. And the Native Americans did go out and fight. And that was the last brutal massacre of Indians by the U.S. Cavalry. It became the last moment of Native American resistance in the American West, and ultimately the Native Americans were defeated. But again, Wovica's message was a little bit different. Keep the dances alive. Keep the traditions alive. But ultimately, the United States federal government responded to these Native American prophets like Somaha and Wovico and, and Wabzi Wob. Uh, through passing either state level and then later federal level legislations that sought to eliminate American uh, Indian practices. So things like the ghost dance, uh, all the way up until 1978, was forbidden in the United States. And that a Native American that was caught doing the ghost dance was immediately imprisoned um, in jail for, I think, 20 years. Uh, and so it was a very harsh crime. And so many Native American practices. So the federal government, because they were so afraid of like what Somaha was doing, was arguing that we bring back the practices and then by bringing back the practices, we will fight. But however, there was a split between the Native American communities, people like Wovica that was saying we bring back the practices, but it's not to fight but it's to keep our traditions alive, to keep them going. But however, the federal government decided that, nope, our fear is what will happen with Somaha. So that's all in most Native American practices in America were strictly forbidden, strictly uh, curtailed, that they could only happen on the reservations, that they could not happen outside the reservations. Uh, but typically federal agents would go into these communities as well to spy on the Native American communities, but it was eventually outlawed. But because during the, but thankfully with the Carter administration, Native American practices were brought back out again and can be, um, because again, Native Americans aren't considered Americans by the, you know, the Constitution. They're considered a federation of their own separate tribes, and so, so thus much of the Constitution doesn't apply to them. So thus things like the Second Amendment doesn't apply to Native Americans. But thankfully now, with the Carter administration, it does. And so Native American practices are protected now in the United States. But however, some Native Americans took to reacting to Western, um, you know, or to American advances or white American advances into the West a little bit differently. Some Native Americans either looked to adopt elements of Christianity. So the most famous of those being um, the Cor uh, de Ali Indians in Idaho who had converted to Roman Catholicism. So this is a huge tribe of Native Americans out in Ohio Idaho 
uh, who are all Roman Catholic and who have their own Roman Catholic bishops. Finally, uh, for a long time, they didn't uh, until the 1960s. They finally had their own Native American bishops, uh, but they were largely Roman Catholic. So you had a lot of Christ uh, Native American communities that adopted um, elements of Christianity. <clears throat> some some uh, Creek, Cherokee, Chickasaw Indians as well have adopted Christianity um, as you know, kind of the official religion of their of their tribes as well. But some of them blended elements of Christianity with Native American practices. So the most famous example of those is uh, the Comanche Indian um, Quana Parker who blended elements of Christianity, Christian styles, theologies, practices with that of Native American practices and thus created a new religious movement among the Native Americans, that being the Native American church. And so here's an example of a modern day example of a Native American church that you see elements of Christianity very clearly on display. You see elements of here, the cross, but the cross is not to represent Jesus. It's to represent Native American cultures. You have an altar that you would see with, you know, Methodists or, or with uh, um, some Baptists or no, well, not much Baptist churches, but Presbyterian churches, Episcopal churches, the Catholic church. There's an altar at the front. But again, it's not towards Christianity. It's more towards elements of Native American beliefs. And so they blended certain elements, again, how the churches are designed, elements that there's a preacher, that there is some kind of tithe and authoring, pews, stuff like that. Some Christian images are still there, are very present, but they are reinterpreted through the lens of Native American practices. So instead of a belief of some kind of traditional gods, there is a centrality now within these Native American church that there is the great spirit, a singular God. Um, but he's not seen as the same light and way that God is so much seen as sometimes as a person. You know, he's referred to as a he, but rather as a, a reality, this ultimate being that's out there as the great spirit. Uh, so sometimes in the Native American churches, uh, the use of pe uh, peyote, is also very common um, part of sac uh, you know um, church services. So it's being presented like in the Catholic Church or the Episcopal Church as sacrament to be taken. Instead, it's peyote to be taken as um, sacrament as part of the normal practices of a Native American church. So it's very popular out in Oklahoma, parts of Texas and Kansas and Nebraska. Um, about I think over a million people self uh, self identify with the Native American church um, but again it blended elements of Christianity and created something new as a new religious movement here in America all right so now let's talk about we talked about the American West so now let's talk about urbanization of American industrialization and the problems that it, those things to eventually do cause in America. So again, one of the outcomes of the Civil War was the equal growth and expansion of urbanization and industrialization. So, you know, prior or in, in 1860, at the start of the Civil War, less than 20 percent of the American population lived in an urban setting like Boston, Massachusetts, Philadelphia, Baltimore. However, by, by you know, the 20th century, 1900, that number was over 40 percent. And then eventually, by the time of World War II, that was getting closer to 60 percent of all Americans lived in a urban setting. And so. Um, and it was all due to industrial jobs, jobs being created. So this is a good example here of a drawing of downtown Oswego, New York, and which is on the border between New York and uh, Canada. So you can see this is, you know, Main Street, um, USA here, you know, where there's the bank and the city government and all that stuff. And what's also here, factories, factories, just along Main Street, USA. So industrialization became part and parcel of urbanization. And because of that, by 1895, the United States now surpassed Great Britain as being the world's leading manufacturer in the world, and subsequently the wealthiest nation in the world, and became the most powerful nation in the world by 1895. 
Um, and so America was able, was quite prospering because of these two things. And because of urbanization and industrialization, wage growth were growing massively by 60% in 1890. And annual incomes rose by 72% in the same period. So Americans were top earners in every single category and every single job aspect versus those in Europe. So America was becoming a dominant force on the world stage. So again, this is part of the Gilded Age period. This is a moment to celebrate. However, despite all of these income growth and income inequality was overwhelming. So again, wage growth rose by 60% by 1890, but at the exact same time, the cost of living rose by 65% during that same time. So as wages were going up, cost of living were going up. So again, 60%, 65. So 5% inequality there that people even though they were making more money they were still left in a large realm of poverty and so because of that <coughs> so because of this large level of poverty and, and, and inequality there was no safety net so if someone um, so for example you know building one of these factories and somebody um, you know, bust their hand on, you know, uh, with a hammer and break several bones of their hand. Sorry, you can't be a worker anymore. You got to find some kind of other job. You lost your pay. You, there is no, there's no um, workers insurance. What if you, for some of these high rises, these uh, city skyscrapers that were being built in the 1890s starting um, and somebody fell, fell and died. And, you know, the fa the husband was the only source of income and he had a wife and had four kids. Sorry, tough luck. There's no help. There was no nothing. There was no safety nets. There was no consumer protection. So a lot of times that was going on, people that were buying meat, for example, in the 1890s, if you bought meat in the open market, almost uh, f uh, it was a study was done about 35 to 40 percent of all meat that was purchased during this time is already spoiled and people were actually uh, using dyes to color the food, color the meat to make it look more red when it actually was already spoiled. And so there was no protection. You can say, Hey, you know, you sold me some bad meat. The guy's going to say, well, that's your fault. That's not mine. You're tough out of luck. So there was no consumer protection. There were no workers rights. Workers typically at that time worked six days a week, sometimes seven days a week. Um, the workers' hours, it was no it was an eight or nine hour work week, but rather a fourteen to sixteen hour work week or work day that people would work. Um, and so there was no workers' rights. Children often worked um, as well, so there was no protection for children. Uh, and and it was because at the time the American government policy was that of the French phrase laissez faire, which means don't do anything. Government policy don't don't mess the system up. Don't react. Don't get involved. Let the system work itself out. If there's a problem, let the system work itself out. So there was no help whatsoever. So um, typically, I think it was 21% of all workers died on the job. So again, there was no worker protection or safety. Uh, unemployment was always at a permanent 8 to 11% during this time because, again, people would get hurt on the job. Um, and there was no safety net. And so poverty was at a very extreme high level, even though this was one of the most prosperous period of American history. As we already see here, wealth and uh, income inequality was growing rapidly during this time. And also at this time, too, local governments were operating on a system of either patronage in which that government services were only promised to those who either had voted for them or certain segments of society who are willing to pay for services like police or firefighting. And many local government services like hospitals, public school educations, uh, policing, fire department were largely ineffective during this time. And so here's a popular video um, or video clip from um, Gaines of New York to demonstrate this effort. Of course, that's just more.
We always liked a good fire in the points. Fire! You could generally pick up a little swag, and if the cops came along, then you really got a show. The municipal police fought the metropolitan police. The metropolitan police, they fought the street gangs. Hurry up, man, before the black joke gets there! There were 37 amateur fire brigades, and they all fought each other. The black joke on their way! But anyhow, a little brief, wanted to show you. Again, that was a good example of you had Tammany, uh, famous Tammany Hall, that was a po political machine in New York City that, um, you know, as a fire brigade, that th this is a way to curry votes, but however, the fire department was fighting the other fire department as the house was burning down, and there was the fire chief there who said, hey, remember, vote for Tammany first. You know, if you voted for Tammany, we probably would have saved this house a lot better, but you happen to vote for the other guy instead, so we're not going to save your house. So this is how a lot of localized governments worked in the United States for a long time. It is because of the American policy of laissez-faire on a federal, federal level that we're not going to get involved in these local issues. And so the local system in America was largely broken and falling apart at this time. Also, worker riots became quite routine and very brutal during this time. So you had the most famous examples being the Tompkins Square Park riot in New York City or the Haymaker, uh, Haymarket Square riot in Chicago, um, where massive amounts of people were being murdered and beat to death by the police. The police would, or, would come in and would beat people to death. Literally, I think in the Haymarket Square riot, over 10,000 people were beat to death. And fires uh, also broke out in Chicago also during this time, too, after the results. So a lot of the problems that were going on that we see today, that we think, hey, this has never happened before, <laughs> on the contrary. Uh, this, is, this is America's history. We have a history that is fraught with government inactions and people revolting against government inactions. So the overall attitude was exactly what the um, contemporary uh, economic uh, scholar Henry George wrote in 1886, but he said Chantel slavery, so meaning the slavery of the Civil War and the slavery of the antebellum South is dead. It has been replaced by industrial slavery as America's greatest sin. So now, after the Civil War, many people in American civilization felt like now there needed to be a new call, a new abolition, a new movement within America to fight for uh, workers' rights, to fight for uh, really progressivism. And so you had the political part, the political movement within America of progressive, progressivism. But that same thing also bled into the American churches and the American communities as well. So let me get to it here. And so now we have the emergence of what is known typically as Christian socialism during this time. And so really since the Second Great Awakening in the 1800s and all the way up to the 1830s, social concerns became to dominate Protestant forms of life. And that really picked up with the abolitionist movement in a Protestant denominations. If it wasn't for um, the, the Methodist Church and later the Presbyterian churches that advocated for uh, um, um, uh, and you know Episcopal churches as well in 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 in, in the northern uh, regions of America that advocated for uh, abolitionism, you wouldn't have that growing political movement on a larger scale. But the events that you know again led to the Civil War drew all the attraction. So slavery became the number one issue, the number one concern for American society on a religious scale. And still, many American Protestants attempted to point out during this time to the real pro also problems of 
social ills. So men like Henry Dexter, who was a uh, Congregationalist minister in Connecticut, wrote a famous book called The Moral Influences of Manufacturing Towns in 1848, where he talked about how industrialization brought about a lot of new social ills like gambling, prostitution, increased levels of alcohol usage because men were working 16 hour day long, six days a week in order, you know, and so that was the only happiness they had was alcohol or the only way people could get to sleep too was alcohol or huge levels of poverty on the streets. And so you had, you know, again, a minister, a method or congregationalist minister writing, trying to ring out the, uh, the, the, the alarm bells of we've got a situation that's growing, going on here in America and it can be indirectly pointed to manufacturing as a great concern. And also, people forget that the Sunday school movement that we take for advantage here in many Protestant churches, um, you know, where you you know people go to church, you know, prior to going to church for a worship service, they'll have a meeting uh, known as a Sunday school where they go and learn about the Bible and stuff like that. The Sunday school movement began really in the UK, but then took root here in the United States as a way to get children off the streets and get children out of jobs. Because again, at this time, children um, were able to work. And so you had you know, some children as uh, early as six to eight years old were working jobs in coal mines and in factories, being runners or being, um, you know, uh, put parts together and stuff like that. And so the Sunday school movement was a way to get children off the streets and get them out of jobs and get them in a place where they could, you know, get a, you know, a free meal and can also have a little bit of education as well. Because usually Sundays, typically no one worked on Sundays. And so children were able to roam free um, oftentimes getting great, great trouble. And so again, the social Sunday school movement was a way to get children off the streets. And then also, uh, here in America, that's very popular, the Salvation Army and the YMCA were attempts to get young, young men also off the streets, um, and get them away from some of the social ills that were caused by urbanization as well. And so the YMCA was a Christian organization that was a, a way to get people within the urban cities to either, um, you know, become saved and become members of church societies or to avoid some of the social ills of society. And same thing with Salvation Army uh, as well. So, however, most Protestant communities uh, were quite isolated and quite ignorant of the social ills because, again, most Protestant communities weren't urbanized. They were, you know, for, you know, for the most part, very ruralized. And um, so you had examples like, I have, as I have here, uh, Stephen Colwell, who would go on uh, these kind of revival tours. But instead of having revivals, what he would do is educational tours in which he would talk about the social ills in Philadelphia. You know, people on the streets bring testimonial witnesses of people who talk about how bad the you know, cities were, how there was no wealth, how you know, children are often starving, fathers leaving, fam you know, they're... they're uh, uh, husbands leaving their wives, fathers leaving and abandoning their children. Everything was very routine in that w there was no help. There was no help within the cities, and so the churches needed to be that help. And so Stephen Colmo created this kind of, tried to create a regionalized movement around Philadelphia to get some of the city, you know, the urban or the rural cities and rural churches to help the urbanization to send missionaries or to send supplies or to create um, shelters or to create services uh, to fill in the gaps where the federal government or local city governments were being woefully behind. However, really everything changed with the publication and America was really shocked with the publication of Jacob Reese's picture book uh, entitled How the Other Half Lives. Um, Jacob Reese was a recent immigrant from Denmark to New York City, and he came to New York City in 1880, and he was blown away at the level of social and e economic inequality within the city, the way that the poverty uh, was rampant, the way that children and families and people lived in this great city of America. He heard about the mythos of America, this land of opportunity, the land of freedom. Um, but yet, when he came to America, he saw 
the opposite. The land, you know, America wasn't a land of opportunity. The land was not a free country. So instead, what he did was for about three years, if I remember right, maybe four, he went around the city with a camera and took pictures everywhere he went of this is how people live every single day. And that was kind of his book. He wrote some parts of it and he had a basic message, but he wrote, but ultimately he showed pictures. And so these are some examples of various pictures of, you know, children sleeping in alleyways. A guy, this is literally a guy's house in New York City that he's sleeping on top of two barrels and um, in an alleyway. Uh, here's children working at a, at a factory yard. Um, and these are houses in New York City, right here, slum houses in between two giant skyscrapers, as you can see here, these slum houses, and you can see the roof is about collapsing, that, you know, some, the roofs here are just put together in makeshift you know, places, and this is how, as he says, the other half lived. And so Riss believed that, if, that the American system was failing because of two key issues, they writes in the introduction to his book that America was failing. Its beliefs, its ideologies was failing because of the, the sin of greed and the sin of wealth. And he believed that, it, that the only reason it was being allowed to happen was because average Americans did not know, did not know the situation of others. So that's why he titled the book the way he did, How the Other Half Lives. Because he believed that one half of the world does not know how the other half lives. So if he was going to show and demonstrate this is how kids live their lives in New York City, you know, in an alleyway, sleeping together for warmth, this is a guy's bed. This is a guy's house in New York City in 1888. People wouldn't stand up for this. And so at the end of the book, Reese argues that he says the solution is that the upper class and the rule and those in rural America have a moral obligation to act. And that Christianity calls is not for profit, but for charity. That this is what America should be about. This is what the churches should be about, about charity. And this is the call. This is the purpose. But however, he believed that the only, way, the, the only solution was going to be is if people in the upper class within the cities could see and look down and see where people lived and those in rural america out in kansas out in you know maryland out in mississippi here in florida that if they knew how the other half of society lived that they would be moved to compassion but then also too that they have to understand they have a moral obligation to act and respond and so really jacob's reese books picture book created a response and we start seeing that a whole host of social responses emerges kind of in response to Jacob Reese's book. So you had, for example, both Jane Addams and Graham Taylor that they create, they create the idea of settlement houses, houses dedicated for people to be able to get get themselves on their feet, that they don't have to pay rent, they have a free bed, free, you know, free bath, that they can, you know, clean up, take care of themselves, they got free food. And so the only thing they have to do is work and save their money in order to build and have a better house. So these settlement houses that worked, you know, great, uh, Jane Adams created one in Chicago that was this the style that became the model for other settlement houses to follow and it became a very common practice all the way up until the 1960s and are still being used halfway houses are still based off this model here and then again we already talked about Charles Sheldon Charles Sheldon wrote a famous book um, in response to what was going on with Jacob Reese and stuff and it was called what would Jesus do so he was actually the creator of WWJD um, but instead his book was a response of a community being invited by somebody like Stephen Colwell comes to the community out in Kansas and tells them of the social ills that are going on in Chicago and that the, the pastors, you know, the, the Stephen Colwell person, you know, gives that basic message. What would Jesus do? And so the rest of the book is a response within that church's community where they're arguing between each other and they eventually get into a fight um you know about how to help people and we shouldn't be helping people because they're not going to help us and that this is you know uh, america's all about pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps nobody helped me so why should i help them and it was to kind of shame Shel uh, sheldon's book was trying to shame them that well what would jesus do 
Jesus wouldn't have these debates. Jesus would instantly help. And so then later you also have many universities like Princeton University, Yale University, John Hopkins University, Harvard later, um, uh, Columbia University in New York. They started creating social programs for the very first time. The idea of a social worker as being an object, uh, as an occupation starts developing response. And so you have you know social programs and social degrees which students could go and work and get specialized. And you also had seminaries. Seminaries who changed their curriculum, um, like McCormick Seminary in Chicago or Andover Seminary outside of Boston, um, New York uh, Union Theological Seminary in New York, that they started developing curriculum that was called, quote unquote, applied theology, in which they looked at ways in which how they can apply the teachings of the Bible to social ills and social problems. And that would be later turned into liberation theology that we'll get to very much later in our lectures. But probably the greatest influencer and thinker of the Christian socialist movement were two men, and they were from two opposite sides of the coin, but they both had a, a belief that should be, you know, Christians are called to ch act as charity. Religious organizations are called for act and charity. And so one was a Baptist minister in New York, Walter Rauschenbusch, and uh, the other one is the, the famous businessman, Andrew Carnegie. Um, but what, what I want to note about both of these men, Walter Rauschenbusch and Andrew Carnegie, both of them, and similarly to Jacob Brees, and similarly to uh, Jane Addams, all of these people were first-generation immigrants, immigrants that came over to America you know, either later in their lives or very early in their lives, and they developed ways at social problems, stuff that they learned from Europe that they brought here. So Walter Rauschenbusch was from Germany, saw some of the social issues that were going on in Germany and how they were solving them, brought it here to America. Andrew Carnegie was Scottish, saw some of the social issues that are in the UK, like Jane Addams, she was from England, how they came and brought them here as well to America to fix some of America's problems. So Walter Rauschenbusch was a famous Baptist minister in New York and then later uh, theologian professor up in Rochester, New York. And what Rauschenbusch called for is his idea of what he known as the social gospel. And that he argued that the Bible and what it really teaches is that salvation goes beyond just simple conversion. Um, that salvation was more, like he says here, more than saving souls, but saving the man. And so thus, he called for a social gospel movement in which the, the churches must instead invest all of their efforts, all of their energy, all of their money into solving social issues and practices and, and, and what he called practicing, quote unquote, real Christian ethics. And so in his famous book here, um, Social Principles of Jesus, and then later on, The Social Gospel, um, in which he dictates and shows that, this, that the gospel is all about this, what is, you know, later gets defined socialism, Christian socialism, that, you know, the, that you are to be like the Good Samaritan, that when the Samaritan, instead of passing by the stranger, the Samaritan takes the time, takes the time out of his day to make sure uh, the guy is, is okay, um, picks the guy up, drive, you know, takes him on his camel to the nearest hospital, pays for his bills. And then told the guy to bill me if there's any more stuff that he needs to be paid for. And I'm going to come back. And so bill me even more. Um, and this is the response that we as Christians are supposed to have. And so it kind of changed the church and the attitude of the church. And so the, the church now, instead of building grand cathedrals to themselves, they started to invest in and, and um, soup kitchens. They started to invest in job centers. They started to invest in um, clothing supplies. They started to invest in training. You know, instead of hiring ministers only, hiring social workers to do social works, running ho uh, hotel rooms or settlement houses in New York City. And so the churches actually evolve and become these kind of, again, to make up the, the social gaps where the federal government or the local government was failing societies. And we often really attribute that to you know things like the Salvation Army and things that we think the church does automatically. That was not thought of. 
But if it wasn't for immigrants like Walter Rauschenbusch and the social gospel movement that argued that the church needs to stop thinking about always salvation only and start focusing on saving the man. And so you have this movement of the social gospel movement. On the other side of the coin was Andrew Carnegie. And Andrew Carnegie was one of the wealthiest men in America. And in 1889, he wrote a famous essay known as The Gospel of Wealth that became an idea. And so his essay argued that wealth, um, in which he proposed that the best way to deal with wealth and quality in America was instead of the churches trying to deal with it, as, Sol as Walter Rauschenbusch argued, that Andrew Carnegie said that really the best way to deal with uh, wealth and inequality was for the wealthy to utilize their great surpluses and give it back. Give it back in responsible means of charity and for mo uh, moral philanthropy. So that's why Andrew Carnegie was famous and, and probably the most popular among the rich, uh, uh, wealthy barons during the, the Gilded Age because he gave back probably the most. And so why we have the famous Carnegie Hall in New York City was because it was built um, by Andrew Carnegie and donated to the city of New York. One of the top secondary universities uh, in America, in Pittsburgh, um, uh, Car Carnegie Mellon University, which is a top research, top technological institution in the, in the um, eastern portion of the United States, was completely funded by Andrew Carnegie and built by his money because this was his way of dealing with some of the inequalities was giving back resources and giving back funds. So you can see here again um, this popular cartoon image of Walter Rauschenbusch in which he gave over a hundred million dollars uh, of his wealth to charity for the public good. So you can see how people saw him as this kind of Scottish Santa Claus having his big bag of money and doling it out as he see fit. But this was his idea of, this, of the gospel movement. Um, instead of you know, having the federal government take my money, he argued that it was the responsibility, the moral responsibility for these rich people to take their money and give it away. And so, and Carnegie also was critical of patrimony. He believed that, uh, and he advocated that um, you should, should not pass down your wealth to your children, that you should use it all up or set it up for charities and social works on your death, and you shouldn't give your children anything. Um, and so he lobbied for that. And he also lobbied hard for the estate tax, in which you know rich people were to be taxed upon their death, um, but because of their wealth and resources as well. And so he was strongly against giving money to your children because he saw the corruption that would ha easily happen with, um, you know, uh, you know, children of very rich families. And we see that even today uh, with a lot of the millionaires and then that they where they inherited their money and why they behaved the way they do, because they have no moral compass. They never had to learn the hard way of really how American life was. And so you had these two ideas of what Christian socialism was to be about. For, for Walter Bush, it was the church that needed to respond and the church needed to be consumed with everything about curing the social ills of humanity. Whereas uh, Andrew Carnegie was more so, a little more thinking about that it needed to be used wisely and responsibly, but it was wealthy people who made the money in the first hand should have the, the responsibility to decide how it should be spent instead of the federal government. But that will eventually change. So now let's talk about the end of this with the uh, immigrations and American experiences um, with religion during the second wave of urbanization with the American, Catholic, uh, American Catholicism uh, here in America and kind of revisiting that. So the most spectacular development in uh, American religious life uh, was the continued, really for the entire 19th century, was the continuous growth of the Roman Catholic Church in America. Uh, and that uh, because of that, that it was constantly growing, growing in leaps and bounds by 1850, it was the largest Christian denomination in America and would hold on to that till really the 1950s. 
that the Catholic Church was the dominant form of Christianity in America, but was still a minority religion and heavily persecuted in America all the way up until really the 19, after 1920, or after World War II, the Catholic Church isn't persecuted anymore. Um, but because of its growth, uh, by 1908, the American Catholic Church was was moved from being this considered by the um, Eastern or by the European Catholic communities or by Rome or Vatican or the Pope himself as being this fledgling missionary ch church to now being on the same status as you know, dioceses in England and France and Germany and Italy because of the level of growth in America that the American Catholic Church now needed to be reckoned with by the European powers. And that will create a, a power flux between uh, how the Europeans saw the American system and vice versa. However, the Catholic growth was largely, again, due to immigration. And so this Im immigration caused a significant challenge within the American Catholic community, as we've already set, set, uh, seen with our first discussion about American Catholicism in America. And it was ha how to wed together all the diverse ethnicities of all these immigrants into the American Catholic Church. How do we do this? That are German, Irish, Italians, uh, Polish, uh, uh, Scandi you know, Lithuanians, um, Czechs, Serbians, how Hungarians, um, Austrians. How are we going to wed all these groups together? Spanish, Mexicans. How are we going to wed them all together into a universal church? Because the Catholic Church never had to deal with that in Europe. So, so think about it again. Germany. Everybody in Germany and the Catholic Church in Germany spoke German. In Poland, everybody spoke. Polish, Serbia, everybody spoke Spur Serbia, everybody was ethnically Serbian to an extent. Hungary, again, everybody was nearly ethnically Serbia. You might have some Serbs and you might have some uh, Romanians in that area, but it was you know, about 87% Hungarian. They all had one language, Italians. We can go down the list in Europe, but here in America, in New York City alone, you've got Little Italy, uh, in Midtown, New York, you had uh, all the little Irish villages up, you know, up up in the up upper parts of Brooklyn, um, Washington Heights, and all that. Um, you had uh, Germantown uh, in New Jersey. You know, Staten Island was Germantown and Dutch areas. So you had all in New York City. How was the Catholic Church going to deal with all of these ethnicities? within the, the Catholic Church. It never had to deal with this. And so this is one of the problems that America fit caused the Catholic Church. So one answer was not even to try to unite these groups. And this was typically the, the, the initial response to many of the uh, Catholic churches in America. Don't even try to unite these groups, but instead allow for each of these groups to create their own national churches or what is known as national parishes. Um, in their areas, and so for so thus you had uh, Irish, you know, people in New York, you know, typically um, flock together in, in St. Patrick's Cathedral there in New York City. You had German immigrants who typically uh, congregated to St. Um, Bartholomew's Catholic Church in New York City. You had Italians that would go to um, St. Teresa's in New York City instead. So you had them typically going to these particular areas. So one popular example that comes from the German Catholic community is that they that the German Catholics believed that if they assimilated to America, if they you know assimilated to American cultures, America English even, that what would in turn would happen was is that they would lose their Catholicism, and in turn would lose their Germanness. So during the German Catholic crisis movement in the 1870s all the way up until the uh, eight, uh, 1920s, the motto within the German Catholic community was language saves the faith. And so what do I mean by that? Well, that meant that Germans within the Catholic churches and their communities kept speaking German. Either they didn't learn the English language or they refused to speak the English language to each other or into church services. And so by c 
keep reviving, keeping alive their German practices, their German cultures, instead of adopting, you know, American clothing or American languages or American practices, they were able to save their community. And thus were able to save their form of Catholicism because they believed that if they embraced any element of the American experience, whether you know freedom of individual thinking, freedom of of uh, you know type of government, the church government of having a congregationally led control government or church government instead of a hierarchical church government like in the Catholic Church, that it would be less and less Catholic. And so, because of responses like this within the German community, you had similar responses in the Polish Catholic communities in New York and Chicago. Uh, Italian communities and, and you know in New York um, uh, this led to a national debate really starting with Teddy Roosevelt's um, presidency uh, at the turn of the century in the 1900s and 1910s uh, the debate on hyphenated Americans and so like that good example here of this photograph here that you see what, what do we mean by hyphenated Americans that they're dressed one way so on this side, on the, I guess this is the right-hand side, that he's dressed like an American, but on the left-hand side, he's, he's dressed like a leprechaun. So he's Irish. So this one, on one side, he looks American, but on the other side, he looks um, Polish. I think this one would be Polish. This one would be German, um, and then et cetera. So you can see halfway, and there's Uncle Sam you know, here. And one of the great cartoonists during this time, Pew, is, has a caption that's down here. You can't read it, but say, why should I let these half Americans vote? And it was this idea because, again, they, they're not Americans. They're not considered Americans because they're not embracing elements of American society. They're not learning our language and they're not um, adapting to our American cultures. So many Catholic communities were continuing to be persecuted, continue to be looked suspiciously because they refused to adopt American practices because they were fearful of losing out on their own communities. And this was the same thing that would go with the Jewish communities. And then later we'll get we'll talk about the, the Greek Orthodox communities as well. They were so afraid of losing their communities. And so in turn, you had people like many of the Polish and Lithuanian Catholics that took the steps even further, and they split it with the American Catholics and created their own Catholic American denomination here in the United States. So the Polish uh, Catholic community in 19, um, 1897, that was completely different um, and still haven't, hasn't come about um, you know, to being reconciled with the American Catholic diocese. And then later on, the Lithuanians in 1914. So this is how responsive they were. They were so afraid of losing out on their culture. But still, you had many other Catholics who argued against this idea of, you know, losing, you know, uh, losing your language meant losing your faith, or adopting American culture meant, you know, not becoming Catholic anymore. Because you had others who contended contended their efforts. And so this is, comes from a Catholic publication in New York in, 18, in 1904 that said, you know, gives this kind of um, uh, statement here, this kind of question. We are apostles to bring people to Christ, not to maintain or implant a nationality or spread a language. And so this was the idea that some people had and continued and wanted to fight back within the Catholic communities the same, wait a minute. This is not the goal of Christianity, or this is not the goal of Catholicism, is to maintain your identity or implant your own nationality here in America. You're, th this is all secondary. Nationalities are all secondary things. And so you had a fight within the American Catholic community. And so it became known as the Americanist controversy within the Catholic Church of what does it mean to be Catholic and how much can we as Catholics embrace American cultures. So many other American Catholics believe that resistance to Americanization is not, not only created unnecessary antagonism, fighting amongst American Catholics and being American Catholics being um, looked at suspiciously by average Americans, but it impeded the growth of Catholicism in America or even the practice of uh, Amer uh, of Catholicism here in America. So you had people like uh, 
the famous Cardinal James Gibbons, who's got, you know, so many um, high schools and universities here in America are named after him. Um, I know when I lived in Raleigh for several years, uh, the, you know, the, the, the best Catholic uh, high school in Raleigh was named after Cardinal Gibbons. Um, but you had Cardinal Gibbons, Bishop Ireland in New York and John Keane in Chicago that they believed that the question was not how to be Catholic in America, but how to be an, an American as an immigrant. And they feel like this is really where the, the fight was going on within the American Catholic community. It was not how to be a Catholic and American, but was the question was really how to be an American. We didn't know. Because at the time, both people like Gibbons and Ireland were understanding that what it meant to be American for a spell was that you had to be Protestant. And that was really where the rub was, was that, you know, American identity was being largely defined by, again, white Protestant ideals and evangelical Protestantism. So you had people like Cardinal Gibbons who wrote endlessly gave speeches endlessly was a very public figure and one of the you know famous things that he wrote and i love this quote here is, is that the clergy and the people no matter from what country they sprung should be thoroughly identified with the land in which their lot has been cast so if you come to america you need to be american basically that they should study its laws its politics and be in harmony with its spirit and a word they should become as soon as possible assimilated to the social body and all things pertaining to common or common domain of civil life. So instead of, you know, for the German Catholics who were coming here, they say, no, we need to still be German. We need to speak German within our communities, work within only German shops, live in German only territories and areas and don't you know, try to assimilate to the country. He said, no, 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 no. You should try to assimilate. You should try to make efforts to assimilate. That is your purpose, is to assimilate and be a productive citizen in our society. Because that is how you will win over Americans. This is how you will show that you are valued, is that you become a value part of society. And you had somebody like John Ireland, who said, There is needed a thorough sympathy with the country. The, uh, the Church of America must be, of course, as Catholic as it was in Jerusalem, as it even is now in Rome. But as far as her garments, they must assume the colors and style of her atmosphere. And what he was saying there was basically there was this fear that, again, if by the, the American Catholic community, that if you adopt elements of American culture, and American practices that you cease becoming Catholic. And John Allen is saying that's stupid. That, of course, the Catholic and its teachings and its theology, the Catholic Church, needs to be true and needs to be as true as it was from the beginning as it is in Rome today. But however, the outside that you're fighting about is just the garments. It's just the tapestries. It's minor things like how the church should function, how the church should be, the local church should be governed. That's minor. And there is the expectation that the church, the American church here, or the Catholic church here in America, should adapt and evolve to look more like America. It's only common sense. It's only natural. And, and so he's arguing back to Rome and saying, you should be accepting of this. But he also argues to those here in the United States. He says, people unwilling to be assimilated do not deserve to be admitted to the country. And anyone who did not rejoice in the blessings of America should take his foreign soil to a foreign, his foreign soul to a foreign soul where he may be crouched in misery and subjugation beneath tyranny's scepter. So again, he's saying if you complain, and a lot of people can identify this now with a lot of the debates that are going on between you know Republicans and Democrats, liberals versus conservatives, or whether a lot of people could like what John Ireland says here. Um, and this was his attitude. It's a little harsh, and I think he's right on the first part, on the, but on the latter part, you can see here 
he's trying to show you like you, you know we need to be fully american here we need to be fully adapted to the practices because of the stuff that you're arguing for is ridiculous and fighting against however the larger catholic church so really the european catholic church but still some elements here in america were very much fearful of american influences and what enlightenment thinking was doing in europe and so this is kind of me giving a a background to why the catholic church responded to the way and responded to america so harshly is because the catholic church was under attack in italy during the unification of the italian kingdoms um you know outside of the roman period the italian peninsula was divided among kingdoms for a very long time the kingdom of naples um of the you know the republics of venice florence uh, genoa um, the kingdom of sicily uh, and Sardinia that they all had control and small and Italy was just this um, confederation of all these small kingdoms but in starting in the 1860s uh, and really uh, being submitted uh, con, you know being um, codified in the 1880s England uh, Italy became a united country for the first time in the 1860s but really more so in the 1880s and part of it was because of enlightenment thinking and the catholic church was anti um the unification of italy and fought strongly against it because they were fearful and rightfully so at the time that they were going to lose their power and control and they in fact did lose much of their power and much of their control they the papal states became no more um vatican was re you know the, the power of the the pope was reduced just really to the vatican city and that was about it a lot of italian churches that were once owned by the catholic church were now owned by the italian government and so it was a troublesome time and so the the catholic church was fearful because they what they were seeing was american principles and american principles like the enlightenment uh infecting you, you know the unification of italy so you had people like Bishop John King who was saying, quote, God had made America to be the mother of all people. So immigrants should come, but also made it to be more than just a motherland. America was meant to be a teacher through whose lips and whose life was to solve the social ills of the old world. So you had where, you know, people like Bishop John King was saying that American ideology should be transported elsewhere and should be going back to Europe and fixing the social ills like monarchy, like, you know, hierarchical papacy that was backwards in its thinking. Uh, and so it was very fearful. So the Catholic Church was very fearful of the quote unquote liberal wing of the American Catholic. And they were arguing for greater emphasis and greater roles and responsibilities in church, church laity, less clerical supervisions, arguing that Protestants weren't the enemy of the Catholic Church, that, they, and that the Catholic Church should avoid forming political parties or avoid committing themselves slow, solely to one party, which they ultimately do, um, you know, to their own detriment. Um and so you had people like, you know, again, Cardinal Gibbons, Cardinal um, Bishop Ireland and Bishop Keene, who are making all of these strong arguments. And because of that, Cardinal and Ireland, uh, or Gibbons and Ireland, took part of the World Parliament, World Parliament of Religion in Chicago in 1893. And we'll talk about this in our next lecture. And both Gibbons and Ireland participated in it and saw it as an opportunity to rebrand Catholicism and religion. So the World Parliament of Religion was all of the world religions coming together and saying, in essence, we all are all saying the same message and that no one religion is superior over the other and that we should all, as all religions, we should be working together to heal the social wounds within our cultures and our societies. And C Cardinal Gibbons was saying, yes, Yes, we all should be you know, working together to heal the social or uh, sh social ills within our communities. However, the Catholic Church took great offense at this because the Catholic Church, like in several Protestant churches as well, took great offense at the World Parliament of Religion because the World Parliament of Religion was saying no one religion is superior to another. Uh, Christianity claims superiority. 
Both the Catholic Church and Protestant Church claim superiority over others. So does um, the uh, Islamic you know, religion as well claim superiority over the others. So many of their, their communities were not receptive to this element. So the larger Catholic world, particularly the Vatican, saw what was going on with the world parliament of religion and going on with the liberal wing of the American Catholic community as a heresy. And, and, and that advocating for religious indifferences and liberalism was a heresy. So in turn, in, 18, in 1899, Pope Leo XIII condemned all forms of what he called Americanism as a heresy which led to greater forms of anti-Catholicism continuing in America throughout much of the 20th century. So American ideas like a greater role for the laity, less clerical supervision, a.k.a. less supervision by a papacy, um, more supervision by a community of people, giving the, the laity within the church more and more powers, very much so much, you know, very much part of the American dream, Pope Leo the Thirteenth declared it a heresy. And so this became, again, setting up the Catholic Church um, for a lot of problems here in America because of this fear of that the Catholic Church was losing its control and losing its fight and losing its power and its dominance that it had held for centuries. And it really would take until the 1960s with the Vatican II Council for the Catholic Church to realize that this is not, you know, this is not real power. That real power comes in cooperation. Real power comes through charity. Real power comes through love. And so once we get to, to our, towards our last lecture and we talk about Vatican II, we'll talk about a significant change as well.